And I firmly believe that when we look at our life experience, there are themes and patterns, there are experiences, and when we can connect the dots, we begin to sort of form a picture of who we are, our philosophy, our vision, and we can carry that into our next chapter. Your voice matters, but you can make it matter more. Through our in-depth conversations with leaders and experts, you'll learn what it takes to move your audience with your message at home, work, and in the world. It's Compelling Communication Strategy brought to you by your host, author, speaker, and strategist, Andrea Joy Wenberg. Welcome to Voice of Influence. Hey there, it's Andrea, and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. Today I have with me Liz Bruner, who is an Emmy Award-winning journalist. Liz's television career spanned 28 years. She conducted an exclusive one-on-one interviews with prominent figures, ranging from professional athletes to global political leaders, including President Barack Obama, as well as cultural icons such as Oprah Winfrey. In 2013, Liz embarked upon her next chapter, becoming the CEO and founder of Bruner Communications, which we'll ask her about in a little bit. (laughs) And she's just published the book, Dare to Own You, Taking Your Authenticity and Dreams into Your Next Chapter. Liz, it's great to have you with us on the Voice of Influence podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Andrea. It's great to be connected with you once again, because we've kind of done this before. (laughs) We have on your podcast. You interviewed me as well. I was delighted to have you as my guest. So thank you very much for the invitation to join you today. Yes. Well, we and we were just talking about how how uh, podcasting can be such a beast in some ways. What what has that um, been like for you? I mean, do you enjoy podcasting? Is it a hard thing? What are your thoughts on that? I love my podcast. I love doing it. I love the people that I get to interview. It's called Live Your Best Life with Liz Bruner. And it's really uh, talking to people who have had life experiences, whether they've been traumatic, they've risen above them, or they've created next chapters by changing directions and things. And it's been so exciting because I have done had so many next chapters myself that I really wanted to be able to share with people, hey, you know what? listen to this story. If it inspires you, motivates you to create your own next chapter or to rise above a challenge, it's so much fun. And also what makes it fun for me, Andrea, is that I don't have to worry about a news director or a producer telling me, you have to have only this much time. I can talk for as long as I want with my guests and I can ask them anything I want. So there's a lot of a freedom, if you will, that I, I have now that I didn't have when I was in television news. Sure, <laughs> sure. I mean, that, that that is so interesting because that is one of the great things about being able to just sit down and have a conversation with somebody and not have the pressure of doing it correctly or um, being confined, but at the same time, um, making sure that there's something good that comes out of it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It is fun. And and for me, it's really kind of meant to be of service in some way. And I know that's what your podcast is also about and and what all of your work is about. And I love the fact that I get to talk to these people. And it's kind of hard for me to take off my my journalism hat when I do them because I'm such a preparer. It's like, I want to know as much as I can possibly know, which is what I did when I was a journalist and a reporter, that I wanted to know as much as I possibly could about the people that I was interviewing. So I've carried that skill over and forward into what I'm doing now. Sure. Okay, so why why is it about having a next chapter? That's that's a lot of the idea behind your book too. You you've you've gone through so many different evolutions and, and taken new paths. Why does that in particular seem to be something that you really want to to talk about? Well, besides the fact that I have done it, mm-hmm. I mean, I started off as a high school music teacher. And then because I felt like there was something more I was supposed to do, I worked in retail till I could, you know, pay some bills until I figured out my next chapter. And then once you read the book, you'll find out how I got into television, ended up having a 28 year career. And then eight years ago, I launched Bruner Communications. And so I'm such a firm believer that no matter where we are in our life, no matter how happy we are, no matter how successful we are, even if you think, wow, this is the best thing I'm doing right now, I think it's important for people to have in the back of their mind, hmm, 
what else might I do at some point in time? And just start exploring them. And when you think about the fact that people don't stay in jobs for 20, 30, 40 years, as our parents and other people did, people change jobs every two years, three years, five years. And so what's that going to be next? And I know when I've had some of my clients who are really close to that retirement age, not because they they want to be done, but because those are the rules of their particular company, some of them, it, it's like a screeching halt and they haven't really thought about what else am I going to do? I'm not really ready to retire and go sit on a rocking chair or play golf every day. What else can I do? And I firmly believe that when we look at our life experience, there are themes and patterns, there are experiences. And when we can connect the dots, we begin to sort of form a picture of who we are our philosophy, our vision, and we can carry that into our next chapter. So I love being able to help people figure that out as well. I just think it's so important in today's world. Mm. All right. You, uh, you grew up singing in church choirs. So there, there's, there's a few little <laughs> parts of our stories that are similar. <laughs> yes, there are. And um, I guess I'm kind of curious is there anything that you remember about that experience that really informs how you look at communication and sharing your voice today? Well, I think singing, as you know, you're a singer as well. You grew up singing in church, and I think you still sing today. And I think singing is just another form of storytelling. And in this case, it has words, the story to set to music. And then when I went into television, I was just still using my voice, but in a different way. I may not have been singing, although there were times that I sang on the set. <laughs> I was known to burst into song from time to time. But being able to carry all of that skill set of what it takes to be a good singer, to have good voice, to sing with good technique, then to carry that through as a journalist and as a reporter, as a news anchor on the news every night, and now to carrying it through to helping people find their voice, not only how to use their voice well, how to speak well, how to have good articulation, how to have great vocal varieties so that they sound engaging and interesting, but then carry that through to how do you have that inner voice now be on the outside. And I know you and I have that in common too, where we, we both have felt at times in our lives that maybe our voice was trapped inside of us in some way. And now we've learned how to let that voice out as we become our authentic selves. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 there, I have this story that I point back to from when I was in voice lessons in college. And um, I remember coming into the uh, studio with my voice teacher and, and something must have been going on with me. And she looked at me and she, 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 I started to sing and then she could tell something was going on. Well, because of my voice, she could tell that something was going on. And she asked me, are you okay? And then she just was like, we, we got to talk it out. We got we to gotta know what's going on <laughs> before you try to use your voice to be able to do anything with it. You know, you, you really have to deal with that sort of internal stuff that's going on. What, is that an experience that you've had? 100%. I mean, think about it. Our voice is the one instrument we all play. We all have a voice. And unless there's a medical issue going on, we can speak, we can sing. Well, maybe not everybody can sing, but most of the people can. And they may not think they can. But what happens is anytime anything's happening to you emotionally, physically, uh, mentally, spiritually, all of that affects your voice. If you're nervous, your voice is affected. If you're, you have a cold, your voice is affected. And if you're th going through something that's traumatic in your life or challenging in your life, there's stress and that can play an impact on your voice as well. And so if you can figure out a way to release that, then you're able to use your voice, but it absolutely impacts it. And, and because our, our voices are inside our bodies, it's internal. It's not like any other instrument that you, you pick up, like a trumpet or a violin. And it's not like a piano or the drums that you can sit down and play. It's a part of you. It's a part of your body. So whatever is happening to you on the outside and on the inside, it affects your voice. Yeah, it's so personal. It's it so is. it's so intimate. It's it's not the same as playing a saxophone. I mean, it, it that is in some way there's something personal to that, but um, mm -hmm. with your musical expression or whatever. But when it's your own voice, and that gets rejected, that's mm -hmm. that's a totally different scenario 
I think. Oh, sure. For people. When you think about auditioning for something, some role that you might be singing for and you don't get it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you take it personally. It's like, what's wrong with my voice? Why, you know, why? And so it's, it's different than, oh, maybe I just didn't play my best that day. Yeah. It's your voice. It's very personal, very intimate, very intimate. Okay. So I live in North Platte, Nebraska, which is where the Nebraska, um, Miss Nebraska pageant happens every year. You were Miss (laughs) Illinois, correct? Correct. A long time ago, 1979. (laughs) It so counts. But one thing that I've noticed when I've attended uh, the, the pageant is that there are some people that have really great voices, but they choose a poor song for their voice. It's the wrong song for their voice. The wrong song, yeah. yeah. But then there's other people who have maybe, maybe they don't have, you know, the, as much vocal range and control, that sort of thing, but they chose the right song and it, and it hits. What are your thoughts on choosing the right song for your voice? And I'm really not talking now about singing. But when it comes to us and expressing ourselves, our message, that sort of thing, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's twofold, Andrea. I do think it has something to do, first and foremost, with your own instrument. Because let's face it, I mean, as much as I want to sing jazz or I might want to sing rock, well, I'm not really interested in singing rock, but that's just not my voice. I mean, I could probably train and learn how to do that, but that's not my comfort zone. I'm a classically trained singer. I don't always have to sing opera, but I'm a classically trained singer. So me trying to do some other genre without training would be very hard for me. So that in and of itself is to pick the right song, the right type of genre that works works with your voice. And then the second message of that is that, yes, what is the message that you want to share? Does it speak to your truth? What are you trying to say? What's the story that you want to tell? Why is that song important to you? Because if you can't connect to the story of the song, you're not going to be able to deliver it, I don't believe, as authentically as someone who maybe, maybe they don't have the best voice in the group, but they chose the right song that had the right message that fit their vocal range. And so, and they had maybe that stage presence and that confidence and that authenticity to pull it off. What I love, I love, for example, The Voice and all of those shows and America's Got Talent. And when you hear these people performing, what makes it so special is they're not necessarily perfect, but they deliver a type of performance that speaks to perfection and authenticity. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. It's Mm -hmm. a really an authentic piece of performing. Have you seen people in your, in your work with, in communications and coaching, have you seen people really feel like they have a passionate connection to a message, Mm -hmm. but the expression of it doesn't quite match (laughs) up? All the time, Andrea. I'm, I'm sure you must see this as well in your work too. What I love about There are many things I love about the work that I'm doing coaching people with their messages and their presentations is helping them be able to allow that expression. And I call it vocal variety. And to me, vocal variety is, do you have the right pace? Do you have the right rhythm to your speaking pattern? Is the pitch of your voice right for the message you're delivering? And all those things that go into it because that impacts how the listener hears your message. So you may have the greatest message in the world, but if you're not delivering it with vocal variety and inflection and um, emotion, it's not going to come across. I'm sure you're familiar with Maya Angelou's quote. This is one of my favorite ones. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. You have to make people feel something. So what is the meaning behind the words? What's the emotion behind the words? Why are you even saying those words? And when you can get people to kind of hone in on that, and then you work with them on how to deliver it, it's so much fun. And I often will use an example of asking people, have you ever read a children's book to a child? Oh, yeah, of course I have. Well, what do you do? What do you do when you read a book to a child? (gasps) Sometimes you're more emotional, and sometimes you're more dramatic, and you put in little voices. Well, you're not going to be that dramatic if you have to deliver a speech or a presentation. However, the same principles apply. What are you trying to do? 
you want to engage your audience. You want to engage your audience. You have to put your emotion into it mm. and you use that with specific techniques and tips. So it sounds conversational. And I come back with what Liz's four C's are. Number one is confidence. Number two is you got to know your content. And number three, you have to have clarity of your content. Can everybody understand what you're saying? And then be able to share it in a conversational way in which people feel like, wow, I can't wait to hear more of what this person has to say. Hmm. You, you, your, your dad was a minister. Your dad was a pastor? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, how did having a minister... <laughs> at my, okay, wait. My grandfather. Oh, boy. Father, here we go. My father, my brother, my uncle. Uh, yeah. I have enough ministers and doctors in my family to sink a battleship. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. They're all over the place. That's great. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm like, yeah, there's a family tree there. <laughs> there is a family tree. And so that means you come from some traditions. You come from some probably expectations, mm. some um, experiences that you, I mean, when, when your dad and your brother and your everybody else in your family who's, <laughs> you know, when you get up every week in front of a group of people and you're wanting to convey a message that is going to touch people and at the at the heart mm -hmm. there's something about that 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 is uh that's a lot of responsibility number one mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work number two and um i'm just kind of wondering what you personally experienced and learned from seeing that happen week after week and and that sort of thing i talk about this in the book a little bit which is that because that's what our family did. My father was up there and I was singing in the church choir. I mean, we were just expected to, to do that and we could easily do it supposedly, <laughs> you know? And, and so did I ever have nerves? I, I, yeah, I probably did, but there was just this sort of unspoken expectation that of course we'd be able to do it. That's what we do, plain and simple. But to your answering your question, yes. I think that I learned a lot by just watching. I learned a lot by doing. And a lot of people, I think some of their, their fears and their nerves come from the fact that they didn't have those kinds of experiences. They didn't have experience being up in front of people. And I, I'm always so excited when a client will say to me, well, I did drama class many years ago when I was in school, great. Or I was on the debate team, fabulous. Because all of that experience of being able to get up in front of people in some way, shape, or form carries over. Again, it's those experiences that you connect the dots with that can lead to something else if you really are willing to step back and look at them. So absolutely, I know I had to have learned something. And then between being in the church choir and all the choirs in school and taking voice lessons, yes, I was always performing and doing something. Yeah, that's interesting. The expectation, which was just there. I think I think of my experiences growing up because they were somewhat similar mm -hmm. that I think that I learned early on that my voice mattered. I mm -hmm. learned that if I get up on stage, there's something that happens that's important and that I can do it, that it's important for a kid, you know, even though I'm a kid, it it matters. And I I don't know how many opportunities there are out there anymore to do that sort of yeah. thing, you know? I, I don't know either because, right, exactly. And I, unless your, your family is one that participates in some sort of a, a, a church community or a scout group or something where you have that opportunity or a play, or I don't even know what groups are available for kids anymore because so many schools have cut back on, on funding for music and for drama and all those kinds of things. But those are where those experiences really, really eventually I mean, certainly they, they have an impact at that point in time, but they have a profound impact later in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Something that I've noticed with high achieving women is that they often downplay or hold back things that are inside <laughs> of them. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that that one of the things that you felt you had to downplay or that you chose to downplay was your appearance when you started in broadcasting. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why you felt it was necessary? Well, as I share in my book, Dare to Own You, I had a lot of experiences growing up that made me feel like I shouldn't 
let that out. I, I, I was not allowed to be myself in that regard. I was criticized for being the way I looked, uh, whether it was my skin color, whether it was in college where I was in pageants and people thought that there was some sort of expectation that, oh, well, Liz must think she's something special, you know, so let's, you know, and, and I don't think they said in their head, so let's be mean to her. But I, I had a lot of girls who were mean to me. Hmm. And I was, I, this is a story I didn't put in the book, but I, I remembered it after I sent it off to the publisher, but I must've been in junior high and the girl who was a school bully, I remember her and her gang coming along, walking in the hallway with me and I had my books in my arm and she literally shoves me up against the lockers and my books go flying. And she says something, what, you think you're better than us? Just because you look like, I mean, I, and I remember this and I was like, why didn't I put this in the book? But it was just, you know, a lot of memories have started to surface after I started writing. Mm. And so when you have those kinds of experiences or you have your, your college dorm floor taking the full length mirror off the dorm wall and putting it in your room, your dorm room and saying, now you can look at yourself all day long those are very hurtful. Those are, those are really very challenging. I don't want to say traumatic, but they're very hurtful. Mm -hmm. They're very hurtful. And so when I continued to kind of have those experiences, it's like, you know, and it was sort of this, this dichotomy of, oh, well, I'm in a quote unquote beauty pageant. That's what people call them. It was actually a scholarship competition, but that's most people call them beauty pageants. Mm. And so then, and now you flip it around and you're supposed to be the serious journalist that, you know, looks don't matter. And yet you're on TV. It's like, it's, it's all, it's all back and forth and back and forth. And which is the truth, right? Right. Which is the truth. And so I just wanted people to see me for me. I wanted people to see me for me. And you for you was besides your looks, besides your appearance is what you're saying. Yes, exactly. Who you were on the inside? And just what was on the outside. It's what's on the inside. That's yeah. what I wanted people to see. Yeah. Did you come to a point where you felt like, I mean, I think you obviously did. You came to a point where you kind of could find a balance between those things. Um, mm -hmm. When did you yeah. start to own your appearance? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> That's a really good question. And I don't know if I know the answer to that, Andrea. I think probably, and this is going to sound very strange. As I think about it, I think I finally started to own that maybe about 10, 15 years ago. So not that long ago, not that long ago. And I think it was towards the end of my television career where not only was I feeling more confident just about who I was, I really didn't care. I'm like, well, if you have a problem with me and I would run around the, the newsroom with my curlers in my hair. So <laughs> a lot of people saw me with curlers in my hair all the time. And I just, at that point, was like, you know, this is, if you don't know who I am right now, then that's your issue, not mine. Hmm. So now how do you see a woman's appearance? A woman's, yeah, I, I guess, how do you see women? Okay, let me... So now how do you see women's appearance impacting their credibility? It's interesting because it's a topic that I do talk about in a lot of my workshops. And I'll give you this example that I share with everybody. It was a study that was done at Harvard. And there uh, were two groups of people. They both had men and women in both groups. And both groups were shorn, shown images that had four columns of women in different, different ethnicities and different looks. So column number one with four women, different nationalities, no makeup. Hmm. Column number two, a little bit more makeup. Column number three, a little bit more makeup. And column number four, we'll call it glamorous. And the task at hand for both of these groups was to determine which column of women, one, two, three, or four, was the most credible, the most competent, the most confident. And group number one was able to look at the photos as long as they wanted to. 
Group number two, again, both groups had men and women in them. Group number two only got to see them for a split second. And the results are fascinating. The results show that column number three that had more makeup and then column number four, both of those two columns were deemed by both groups, no matter how much time they spent looking at them or little time, were the most competent, trustworthy, confident, and credible. Hmm. And when I shared that, when I share this research with people, I remember there was one group that I was speaking to and the, the women were all up in arms. And I said, look, this is what the research suggests. Now, I happen to believe that we should own who we are because our attire, our picture that we present to the world is it shows our intention. And if you can connect the dots from this standpoint of, well, unconsciously, somebody will look at you, whomever that may be, you're looking at someone and in their mind, it's like their computer brains going, and this is all unconscious. And it's like in nanoseconds. And if you look put together, I'm not saying model perfect, but if you look put together, that person who's looking at you is going to go unconsciously, they look put together. That means they take care of themselves. If they take care of themselves, they're going to take care of me, my project, my portfolio. So that's part of the connection. Mm. And I also believe that our attire communicates our intentions. You know, and in, in this Zoom world that we've been in for almost, what, a year and a half now, I mean, what I see people showing up in on Zoom, I've actually seen people in bathrobes. And, and quite frankly, I mean, it's like, what's your intention? How do you want to be perceived? Now, we can't control 100% of how people are going to think of us and what they're going to see. But if somebody's forming a perception of you in the first three to five seconds, you can't tell me that your appearance does not matter. Now, I wish it didn't for women as much as it does, mm -hmm. but the facts are the facts. So let's play by those rules and own who you are and, and use this to your advantage. You know, I mean, maybe years ago I would downplay it. Now I'm like, I'm using it to my advantage. My God, yes. <laughs> right? Come on, bring it on. Love it. Yeah, you know, it is, it is, it's part of our self-expression. So if yes. if what are what we're saying on the outside is I'm in my bathrobe, I don't really care, then exactly. what is what do you what do you expect people to think about what's going on inside? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what people don't get most of the time. They think, well, why should my looks matter? I want, I want my, and I have women tell me this all the time. I just want to be known for my brains and, and what I contribute. And I'm saying, absolutely. I want that too. I want that for you also. But the facts are, this is, this is how people perceive us. And I had one client, a woman in New York who got very upset with me when I was showing her this research that I just shared with you. And she says, well, I said, just consider maybe even putting on some lipstick. Well, my boyfriend doesn't like lipstick. I said, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm just sharing with you how you might be being perceived. Mm -hmm. And if that's, if your intention is to be perceived as confident, competent, strong, capable, you know, how does this impact that? Mm -hmm. It may or may not, but just think about it. Mm -hmm. Sermon ended. <laughs> <laughs> what is something that you do to build your confidence when you feel a lack of confidence? Oh my gosh, I have so many little go-to tricks. I think the biggest one, uh, besides journaling a lot, besides uh, taking care of my body exercise-wise to help get those natural endorphins going, I'm, I'm a big proponent of positive affirmations and quotes. And there's a lot of quotes in the book because I'm just, I love quotes. But one of the games that I created for myself, because there were times when I was struggling, and I call it my ABCs. And I would do this when I was out on a run or a walk, and it would be, okay, A, I am authentic. I am awesome. I am athletic. B, I am brave. I am bold. I am beautiful. I believe. C, I'm connected to the divine. I'm confident. I'm calm. And I would try to come up with as many adjectives as mm. I could possibly come up with. And believe it or not, when you do that on a consistent basis, if you believe the words that you're saying, that's key. If you believe the words that you're saying, you end up replacing some of those negative tapes that happen in your head, right? You replace the negative habits that happen. 
those, you, those old tapes. So, so that sounds like, okay, so if I'm not feeling like I'm brave, I maybe I need to find something that I am, that I can own yes. and let Absolutely. it push out the, the other, the idea right. that I'm not brave. One of the things that I did in the book at the end of every chapter is time for reflection. And I offer some exercises and thought provoking tools for people, questions for people to ask of themselves. And that's one of them. It's when was a time when I, I felt confident and, and how did I get there and what did I do? Or when was a time when I felt like I was a failure? Not that I want to dwell on that, but what did I learn from that? And so each of the chapters, there's, there are very specific questions that I want people to contemplate, reflect on, write out in a journal, so that you can begin to really try to understand where is some of this coming from? What are these limiting beliefs that I have? And, and let's be honest, the confidence barometer goes up and down, all right? There's some days that we're, man, I'm on top of the world. I, I've, I got this. I got this. And then there are other days, eh, I don't feel so great about everything. That's okay. Just pick yourself up and see if you can't just even incrementally move the dial. Hmm. Incrementally. Okay. Uh, well, okay, you interviewed President Barack Obama. How okay. did that happen? Oh my gosh, it took four years, <laughs> first of all. Really? Yes, when he was elected president and he was the first African-American to been elected president, I, I wanted to talk to him. And I had never talked to a sitting president and I thought, well, no harm in asking. And so I started writing letters to the White House to a generic email address at the media communications office. I did not have a name. There was no phone number. There was no other information that I could grab and find. So I blindly wrote letters for four years, not getting a response. People made fun of me in the newsroom. Oh, there it goes. Liz. She's right in the White House again. You know, I thought, well, I had nothing to lose, right? I had nothing to lose. And then finally, after his second term, when he got elected, I got an email response and it had a name and Doug knew me from Boston and he was now in DC and he said he wanted to make this happen. Oh my gosh, I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. And of course, then what was really funny about that, Andrea, is there were people like, well, why is why is Liz going to the White House? I'm this, I'm this sort of reporter. I'm that sort of reporter. I'm like, because I'm the one who wrote the White House for four years. Because I asked. Because okay. I asked. Yes. You know? Exactly. Yes. And I was the only Boston reporter to have gotten an interview with him. Yeah. 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 That's great. Pretty exciting. Pretty I love exciting. that. Yeah. It's such a... You know, yeah, go ahead. Now, one other point is that, you know, it doesn't even matter your politics doesn't matter. It's that that I had the opportunity and the privilege and the honor of of inter interviewing a sitting president. Who gets to do that? <laughs> not right? very many Besides people. Besides all the network people. Not too many people, right? No, <laughs> exactly. Um, what was one of the hardest stories that you had to report on in your career? Oh, 9-11 um, for one. And, you know, there were days that were really, really tough. And I followed the victims' families at six months, at one year, at two years, two oh, years, wow. five years, yeah. and then 10 years. I mean, wow, the transformations in their lives were extraordinary. It was a real privilege. Hmm. The Boston Marathon bombing. At the time, I lived blocks away from the finish line. You could see the finish line looking out my dining room window. Mm -hmm. And below the window was the roof of the Boston Public Library. And I would see, I mean, it was, it was incredible because that afternoon, I literally went on the air with my hair in a ponytail and no makeup on because they were screaming at me, where's Liz, where's Liz? I was the only anchor in the building at that point in time. And I'd come in early that day. And I went on the air and I was on the air for another 12 straight hours. Wow. And then I wasn't allowed to go home because, or drive myself home, I should say. And so I'd come to work once I was able to go home and come back again, and I'd be talking about it 24 seven. And I would go home and I would be greeted by armed guards that looked like they had machine guns. And the city was so desolate. And you're looking out your window and you're seeing 
you know, uh, inspectors and, and detectives in sterile white suits, you know, looking for debris. And you're looking at a growing memorial in Copley Square of the running shoes and the candles and the cards and the teddy bears. I mean, it's gut wrenching. Mm -hmm. It was gut wrenching. I had no escape. Mm. I had no escape from it. There were so many, I mean, I feel privileged that I had the opportunity to be able to share with viewers that it's okay. I'm delivering bad news, but things are gonna be okay. Mm. You're gonna be okay. How did Tough you, stuff. how did you cope? Oh, prayer, tears, talking to people. And I remember at one point, I didn't want to go over to that memorial for the Boston Marathon bombing at Copley Square, even though I could see it. And I forced myself to go over one day because I was like, Liz, you got to get past this. Hmm. You got to get past it. You got to go. You got to look at it. And it's so interesting, too, talking about 9-11, because we just had the 20th anniversary. And I decided a couple of weeks ago when it was the 20th anniversary, there was a small little memorial going on in, in um, the common, Boston Common. And I thought, I'm just going to go over. I knew some people had put a bunch of flags up for all the victims. And I went over. And I happened to see the videographer. Um, his name is Zip. Isaiah is his real name. We always call it, always called him Zip. And I looked over and I went over and I gave him a big hug and I went, oh my gosh, Sip, you and I were together on 9-11. You and I were together when we were told to go to this woman's home and find out if she would talk to us because we suspected her husband was on flight 11. And we drove up to her home and I told Zip, I said, just stay in the car because I saw this woman sitting on her front porch sobbing, looking like she was seven months pregnant. I said, let me go talk to her first. And to me, I don't know what the symbolism is, but to me, the fact that I saw Zip 20 years later at this 9-11 memorial and he and I were together, working together on 9-11 20 years ago, you got it. That's, that's not a coincidence in my mind. That's a godsidence for whatever reason. Hmm. Wow. I can't imagine trying to approach her. It's not easy. I mean, she, the first words out of her mouth were, do you know anything? And I said, I'm oh. so sorry. I don't. Oh, huh. yeah. You know, and I just, I just couldn't ask her for an interview. I, I just couldn't, not that day. It's interesting, the need <clears throat> for us to remember our own humanity and the humanity of others, even when we have um, something to say or something to report or a job to, to share do. a job to do. You know, I, I always said to people when they would ask me, you know, how, how do you do it? Cause sometimes it's like so much bad news. And I said, well, first of all, I'm a human being first, I'm not a robot. I'm a human being first. And yes, do I have to compartmentalize sometimes so that I can get through a story without crying? Sure. But at the same time, I am a human being first. And that emotion is going to come through. Hmm. And I was always proud of that. Yeah, yeah. What advice do you have for the media industry now with all <laughs> of the... First of all, the... I'm glad I'm not in it. Yeah. <laughs> <Right> <laughs> no, I mean, it's just so different from when I was in it. I mean, when I started, you know, well, now, my God, how many years ago? Over 35 years ago when I first got in the industry, everything was very black and white. Everything was very black and white. And now I feel like there's just gray. And I feel like too many reporters, talk show hosts, whatever, they all have an opinion. They all have a shtick. They all have something to say. And quite frankly, I'm not always interested in what they have to say, especially if it's a newscast. I just, please let me make my decision. Let me form my own opinion. So I just feel like it's very political and I don't miss any of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think my station was political, but you know, I've been away from it now for eight years and I feel like there's, there's a lot that's changed in the last eight years. It's just very, very different. Mm. So if you were to be able to come in and wave a magic wand and mm. uh, improve trust and goodwill toward the media, what, what do you think, you know, what would be the, the main thing that you would change? Well, 
I don't know if I could change it, but I think what I would want people to know is that most journalists, not all, but most journalists, there is integrity, there is character, and they're not out to gotcha. Some are because that's the role they play. But we're human beings first. Most of the time, we just want to get it right too. Mm. And we make mistakes sometimes. We're humans, we make mistakes. But my experience has been most of us try to get it right. Do we always succeed? No. Mistakes happen. But I also think that for those people who are interested in going into this industry, it's very different than it used to be. A lot more is expected of you. And I always come back to what's the role you're playing. And it is to share information with the viewer that is somehow going to be helpful in some way. Tell me the story of something that's going to be helpful. So I don't know if I could wave a magic wand and fix it, but it's just very different than what it used to be. Hmm. All right. Two more questions for you. Okay. First one being, where can people find you and your book? And Thank you. Yeah. Well, all kinds of places. Basically, go to lizbruner.com. That's L-I-Z-B-R-U-N-N-E-R.com, lizbruner.com. That is my coaching platform. It also will have a lot of information about my book coming out, Dare to Own You, Taking Your Authenticity and Dreams into Your Next Chapter. And I also have a number of online courses on bruneracademy.com. And my flagship course is How to Be a Rockstar Public Speaker. And it's not just for somebody who has to give a speech or a presentation. It's for anyone who wants to be on a podcast. Maybe you're on a panel. Maybe you uh, have to give a wedding toast. <laughs> this course will help people with all of that. And also in alignment with the book, I'm also producing four DARE courses. And one of them is DARE to go for your goals. The second is DARE to rise above tough times. The third is DARE to shift from procrastination to motivation. And the fourth is Dare to Find Peace of Mind, which is really a beginner's course on meditation. So those are some of the places people can find me besides social media of LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And I invite everybody, follow me, subscribe, do all of that good stuff. And my podcast, of course, Live Your Best Life with Liz Bruner. I'm on all the major directories. <laughs> was that enough of a plug for you? That was <laughs> <Andrea>? great. <laughs> okay, good. All right, last question. What last piece of advice would you have for somebody who would really like to have a voice of influence? Hmm. I think it begins with literally what the title of my book is, which is own who you are, dare to own who you are. Give yourself permission to own who you are. And one of the quotes that I have in the book, it's, it's a Joseph Campbell quote, which is, it's a privilege of a lifetime just being who you are. And when we can get to that kind of authenticity and honesty and integrity, our dreams can become reality and our voice can have influence. One of the things that I love that you have in your book about voice is choice. Voice equals choice. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Our voices are one of the most powerful communication tools we have. So learn to use that voice in a positive, healthy way starts with owning you. That's the foundation. Mm. Thank you so much for being here, Liz. It was great to have you. Thank you for being a voice. You've of reached the conclusion of today's episode, but we encourage you to visit voiceofinfluence.net for more resources, show notes, and ways to immediately empower your voice with updated, actionable tips to build your compelling communication strategy. Again, that's voiceofinfluence.net. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to helping you make your voice matter more. Give yourself permission to own who you are.